On June 9th, the German main attack came. Within two days, the German armored and motorized divisions roared out into the open terrain. With this breakthrough, the issue of the Battle of France was decided, and from that time on, there was official talk of an armistice. Hi, I'm Diane Gregg, and welcome to Invisible Women, a podcast about eight women who worked in espionage during World War II. They were from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds. But what they had in common was the opportunity to step outside of societal norms, while at the same time working in the shadows. And while their contributions were incredibly important, they've been hidden. Invisible Women is an opportunity to hear their stories, to explore their roles in society, and discover what we can learn from their stories that's relevant today. I was trained for three weeks by the French intelligence. I had to memorize all German uniforms, medals, ribbons, weaponry, and all types of ground troop movements. I was taught Morse code, maps, diagrams, and practice shooting different kind of guns. I found out I was a crack shot. And before going into enemy territory, I was interrogated fiercely by my own army. That's Ella, a young Jewish woman who worked for the Free French Army. Through her story, you will hear how in order to contribute to the war effort, she had to hide her Jewishness, which she did even when enlisting in her own country's army. This episode of Invisible Women is about shadow projections. In previous episodes, you've heard me talk about the fact that women spies were especially successful in World War II because of the gendered cultural assumptions the enemy held about women at that time. The fact that women were viewed in a bipolar way in European culture, that is as the virtuous virgin or the harlot. Because of these cultural blinders that women were not expansive creatures and not capable of doing the varied and brave tasks of espionage, it was easier for women to cross Nazi checkpoints, carrying crucial documents or weapons or do reconnaissance because they were not seen as a threat. The Nazis projected these stereotypic beliefs onto the women agents, and the women worked with these projections instinctively and or consciously to deceive the enemy. Some of these projections still existed when I began my research in 2004. I called around to various archival sources to try and find World War II women agents to potentially interview. My very first discussion was with a museum historian. After explaining who I was looking to interview, that is women in espionage, he asked, why would you want to study women who prostituted themselves to gain secrets? I was shocked that his viewpoint seemed so definitive, unyielding, and so quickly given. His stereotypic view was delivered without a second thought, and he seemed to have no room to imagine or think beyond his response to me. He hadn't asked himself what they may have contributed or how courageous they had been. Everything they may have accomplished was trumped by a sexualized lens. His projections were a powerful statement about the cultural shadow surrounding women spies at the time. These comments from a historian spurred me on even more to find the women. I hoped that by capturing their authentic, courageous narratives, that their contributions would be celebrated as opposed to being dismissed. I thought Nazis were crazy people, stupid fanatics. But unfortunately, it was not so. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Of course, that was not easy to do. They had to work hard to do it. You see, We human beings are not born with prejudices. Always they are made for us, made by someone who wants something. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. Somebody is going to get something out of it, and it isn't going to be you. This is not classroom theory. I saw it happen. In World War II, there weren't just projections onto women. There were projections onto the enemy, of course. 
but no beliefs were as evil as those that were displaced onto the Jewish people. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about projection. It's a natural inherent mechanism in the psyche that displaces preconceived beliefs and contents of the unconscious onto the external world and others. In doing so, its framework structured by evolution and culture helps us make sense of our world, keeps it stable for us, and makes it less anxiety provoking. However, generally, when automatic and unculturated beliefs are displaced onto another person or group, they're not especially or necessarily accurate. So we need to examine these beliefs so that we're not living in a, like a controlled hallucination of sorts of what is true or real. If we examine our assumptions and presumptions about others, we can achieve a broader perspective and greater clarity. So a notorious example of how projections may have wide-reaching and disastrous consequences is the Nazis regime's attitude towards the Jewish people. Hitler instinctively hooked into extensive societal discontent in Germany and displaced his aggression and evil characteristics onto the Jewish people. This was amplified and fueled through propaganda and false scripting, all twisted for his own power and control. The Nazi regime's shadow projected onto the Jewish people made them a scapegoat, hiding the evil intentions and face of the real perpetrator. Through using mass discontent and false scripting, society became a far larger policing force for Hitlerian projections, making every moment of every day extremely dangerous for a Jewish person. Not examining cultural shadow assumptions can be disastrous, as I mentioned, for a nation, a group, or an individual. Bringing awareness to these invisible lenses and their potential manipulation by those in power is paramount to the health of society and the individual. And we can only shift collective beliefs through the individuals within it. So knowing oneself, including making conscious what is in your personal shadow, is more important today than ever due to social media tracking of all your behaviors and potential for manipulation of them. I'd like to share an example of how my own shadow projections were revealed to me, catching me completely unaware. When I graduated in 2006, I was looking forward to sharing my insights about feminine cultural shadow, espionage, and women's narratives. It had been a long four years completing my PhD while having family responsibilities. So late that year when the opportunity presented itself at a conference in the Loire Valley in France, I took it. It was fall and the leaves were beginning to change color. The manor house on the farm I stayed in was chilly in the evenings, but the nights looking out over the window panes to the French fields couldn't have been prettier. The fields were yellowing in the autumn and well lit as it was the week of the full moon. I could easily imagine the allied planes sweeping in and agents dropping into the manor's lit fields and shadowy forests. It would have been fairly easy for the welcoming resistors to hide in the clumps of dark trees and later for all agents to go unnoticed in a large farm manor house with all its nooks and crannies. These farms were quite a distance from each other with small forests and fields in between and villages dotted about. The biking distances between drops and meetups would have been long and physically demanding for the agents and dangerous with random Nazi checkpoints. Of course, I was thrilled that my first talk about women, war, and espionage would be in France, and excited that it took place the week of the full moon. However, I was soon disappointed, as my presentation was not well scheduled or attended. In the moment, I thought, perhaps it's because I'm North American speaking on what is perceived as a European subject, but I wasn't sure. Then later, a Russian-born professor I knew was in the common area arguing with a French scheduler, saying that my talk should be rescheduled in the main presentation hall because it is about European shadow and important to discuss. As she saw me walk by, she brought me into the conversation. She was a professor of cultural consciousness. I appreciated her point, but it all felt awkward as shadow discussions often do. And since we were on French soil, I didn't have much hope of being rescheduled. It was a curious thing at that time to witness a Russian woman arguing for my research 
with a French woman regarding World War II cultural shadow in France in 2006. I was grateful that she was willing to confront this, but it was also evident that the French scheduler would have the final decision. Anyhow, at lunch the next day, I was sitting outside at a bistro table, enjoying the autumn sunshine, and an attendee, a woman wearing, I remember, all white, walked up to me with her coffee cup and sat down across from me at the table. She didn't say anything, but rather pulled out a cigarette and lit it. She gave me a studied look and said in a heavy French accent, your work is very avant-garde, but it's hard for the people here. She was poised, deliberate, and silence punctuated the air except for her long inhales on the cigarette as though it was a lifesaver of sorts. My grandfather was in Vichy in 1941, part of the French police. I knew that meant he was probably rounding up Jewish people under Nazi command. He never talks about it. The family just knows, you know? It has affected us so much. Shame. We don't talk about war and what it did to us here. Hmm. I nodded and thanked her. She got up and went the way she came, leaving her empty coffee cup. I never saw her again. But I was grateful for her compassion and effort. In that moment, my own projections were revealed to me. Being from North America, I hadn't appreciated what I was walking into, presenting about war and espionage in France. She unwrapped the felt trauma, confusion, and shame that war had bestowed on its descendants here, men and women. My presentation had been about women spies and dismantling the sexualized spy stereotype and celebrating their contributions. But there were so many more layers to the war story here that I'd not fully appreciated, not having been on the embattled soil. You know, after the war in France, it was very difficult to tell who was collaborating and empowering the Nazis and which women were undercover agents or simply trying to survive and feed their families. Therefore, any woman who had been seen talking to Nazi soldiers risked being labeled as a traitor post-war and being branded, literally. Women were pulled into town squares by men all across Europe and their heads were shorn. Women were ostracized and demonized with a sexualized stereotypic brush. This all repressed the authentic and courageous contributions in historical memory. The women I interviewed only spoke about their war contributions and lives as long as it was anonymous, for fear that they would still be branded with that harsh and sexualized stereotype, like the one I heard, which was still alive and well in the mid-2000s. And of course, most of them had not received any validation, recognition, or medals for their work compared to male agents, which was a signal to them that these beliefs had not shifted. Their roles and contributions were invisible still. Now I'd like to share with you Ayla's story. Ayla was a young Jewish woman who became an espionage soldier within the Free French Army. Through her story, you will hear how in order to contribute to the war effort, she had to hide her Jewishness, which she did even when enlisting in her own country's army. War is not the same for everyone, and it was not for women spies either. We're going to touch again today for Washington. It will be 31 hours in Alpha. In the summer of 2005, I flew into the United States, hopped on a shuttle, and after an hour was dropped on a neighborhood street in front of a meticulously landscaped bungalow. As I walked up the steep driveway, I turned and looked at the sun shining off the Pacific Ocean. Although on the outskirts of a busy city, it was very peaceful there. Ayla, a very petite woman in her 90s, greeted me at the door and her blue sweater and bold blue necklace perfectly reflected her eyes, which smiled easily. After showing me family photos in her den, we settled at the dining room table. I mentioned that although I knew there had been some publicity around her war story, especially due to the 60th anniversary of D-Day, I had purposefully not read about her contributions. I hoped to hear her story directly from her, unfiltered by others. 
She obliged me, remembering so many details easily and well. In 1939, when war broke out, we were living near the German border in France. We left quickly, just taking a few things, thinking we'd be back soon. We went to eastern France, where an uncle lived and found apartments and eventually work. Two of my brothers and two of my younger sisters became more active in the resistance, helping Jewish families connect with farmers who lived on the border, enabling the families to cross the demarcation line into the unoccupied zone. However, one of my sisters was caught by the Nazis. She was sent to a camp, but we planned her escape with the help of the resistance and the camp's doctor. I was working in the city hall when we were invaded, so I had to leave my job because I was a Jew. Then one day, by chance, on the street, I met one of the clerks from the hall. He told me he was now in a position to provide me identity cards without the stamp of Jew on them for each of my family members, all eight of us. I was so grateful to him. While he created them, I planned and organized the escape. A classmate of mine knew a local priest whose church was near the border crossing. And he spoke to him about helping my family go across. The week previous to our escape, our friends and neighbors came to our house to take all of our possessions for safekeeping. You know, after the war, everybody returned everything. On the day of the escape, we took all the yellow stars off our clothes and dressed as farmers, the women with scarves on our heads and long skirts. We decided to go across in two groups. I arrived at the church with my father and siblings first. We had some tense moments at the church. The priest told me he was only helping because he was a good Christian and not because he trusted Jews. I told him I was not responsible for what happened 2,000 years ago or for the death of Jesus. The priest said he disagreed with me, but he did his job of reconnaissance around the area between the church and the border, and when it was clear of German patrols, my father and siblings left to cross over. I waited for hours in the church for my mother and grandmother to arrive by bus. My mother and I helped my grandmother walk to the church as she was not well. The priest was touched by our helping grandmother, so he scouted the area again without arguing. <laughs> because of grandmother's recent operation, we could not go through the fields. We had to take the road, which was more dangerous. We sat grandmother on my bike, and we walked along the sides, holding it, the three of us made what seemed like a very long journey through the town. We progressed very slowly. You know, the Germans offered the farmers along the border a year's wages if they reported on Jews trying to cross. And there we were, walking in front of the farmhouses toward the border. And of course, they all knew. It was August, nice weather at dusk. The men were smoking and sitting in front of their homes, and the women, they saw us, three women arriving, and the grandmother sitting on the bike. It is hard to speak about it. They knew. First farm, it was amazing, they started praying. Some would cross themselves, men kneeled, and as we passed each farm, they did the same. Most beautiful human thing I ever lived through. We made it across the line and met up with the rest of the family. We all waited 24 hours hoping to see my sister come across, but she did not. Later, we found out that her escape was foiled by a German commander. She was caught with a letter from the resistance at the last moment. My mother was overwhelmed. I still fear the loss. 
At this time, my sister, who was a medical student, was helping the sick children in the holding camp. And you know, at first, she refused the escape plan because she was worried about the children. But I told her that our mother would never be able to deal with her refusal. So my sister agreed to go through with the plan. I had contacted the doctor at the camp, and he had agreed to help. He said if I could get her on the list for him to see, he would send her to the hospital. She had kidney disease. And from there, we had help to get her out of the hospital. She could leave with us. At the last minute, the commander decided to change the prisoners who were assigned to see the doctor that day. Ayla's sister's opportunity to escape was thwarted by the commander, and there was nothing else Ayla could do. Her sister was never heard from again. Ayla, now having crossed the border, was in unoccupied France. Oh, being away from Nazi occupation, we could move more freely because of the identification papers. So I decided to finish my studies and enrolled in nursing school in Marseille. My sister and I shared an apartment. My parents and other family members went into the mountains to farm with relatives. During that time, I was also meeting up with a young man I had met through my sister. We had fallen in love. He was a medical student and a resistor. We were apart for six months or so at the time. We only met up three times. The last time, when I returned to Marseille to finish my training, it was in 1943, he said he would write me every day. But after three days, nothing arrived. Then a few days after finishing my nursing degree, I heard the news. He and his brother had been executed by the Nazis. Oh, I was devastated. All I wanted to do was join the resistance in Marseille and undermine the Nazis. I asked a lieutenant I knew in the French army if I could help, and he laughed at me, patted me on the head and said, we don't ask little girls to risk their lives. I went to Paris with my sister and worked, taking care of an elderly woman until the liberation. It was a precarious time. We used the new identifications to move around, but we knew they would not hold up if examined closely. We moved apartments many times, helped by various Parisians. We lived as normally as possible. My sister and I, when we lived in Paris, would go to the theater. There was a play about Antigone. In English, you say Antigone. There is a scene where Antigone is sitting on a bench in a very drab prison room, and the captors talk about her as though she was not there. In the theater, there were always many German army officers. It was full of them. At that scene, everyone who was French would react very strongly, and the Germans could not understand why. We were amazed that they did not realize it was an attack on them. They could not understand at all that it was an allegory. We were almost caught one day by a German intelligence officer, a fellow we knew from our original town who had been for meals in our home. He asked why we weren't wearing yellow stars. My sister quickly got us out of there, saying we had forgotten them. We went back to the apartment, gathered our things, and left. Also, at that time, I asked the Red Cross in Paris if I could help, and they said, we don't hire Jews. So, I decided to visit my fiancé's mother. It was an emotional time. She had lost two sons in the firing squad, and she was quite ill. We helped her recover, and she helped me join the French army. You see, because her sons died as resistors, it made her recommendation powerful. No one knew I was Jewish. I did not inform them 
as there were some anti-Semites within the French army as well. Like the Red Cross, I would not have been able to join. I did basic training and was sent to the Alsatian front. I was supposed to go in as an officer and nurse, but the commander downgraded me to sergeant and social worker because I had not helped the resistance previously and all his men had. I didn't know anything about social work. I was supposed to be a nurse. I was upset, but <laughs> I was adaptable, positive. I was billeted with an Alsatian family in a small village near a narrow section of the canal. Across the waterway were the Germans. They had recently retreated, but there were skirmishes going on. The closer they were to their homeland, the harder they fought. They wanted to protect their families. Every day, I went about my new job in the foxholes on the front line. I would say, I am Sergeant so-and-so, your new social worker. <laughs> Is there anything you need? They were shocked, as they had never had a social worker before. It was winter and below freezing, and I found that the soldiers needed blankets, pens, and the like. I found items through the local townspeople. One day, I was walking to the foxholes, and I met my commanding officer. He asked me to take calls for him as his assistant was busy. He commented that he was sorry there were only German books to read in his office. I told him it was not a problem as I was fluent in German. I had grown up near the German border. He was surprised. And he said the army had been looking for someone who spoke German and the fact that I was a woman was even better. I'd attract less attention. He asked me, if I was interested in doing intelligence work. That was a big surprise. The most important thing is that I would not have done reconnaissance if I had not been asked to replace his assistant that day. No one gave me any directives, and all of that was surprising. In war, there are far more surprises than in peaceful times. And in the army... You are asked to do things you are not expected to do at all. At first, I just said yes. Then when he left, I really sat down and I was very worried. How could I be in such a predicament? But it was too late. I had committed myself. Once I committed myself, I would never go back on my word. But I was very worried. It was something very unusual. My hesitation was not for very long. As soon as they came to pick me up, I never raised the issue. So many people had risked their lives. Jews and non-Jews, for me and my family, it was absolutely necessary to give back. I felt I had to do it. I was billeted in another house and had my own room because I was the only woman. However... Men knocked on my door all night asking for, you know, favors. Thankfully, there was a strong lock on the door. From then on, I was given a French nickname that means Fussy Girl, which I disliked tremendously, but it stuck with me till the end of the war. I was trained for three weeks by the French intelligence. I had to memorize all German uniforms, medals, ribbons, weaponry, and all types of ground troop movements. I was taught Morse code, maps, diagrams, and practice shooting different kind of guns. I found out I was a crack shot. And before going into enemy territory, I was interrogated fiercely by my own army. It was 1945, and I was assigned to the Commando d'Afrique, and upon arriving at my assigned destination, I discovered that 200 of their men had just died that day on the front lines. That was shocking to me. I was working for the commanding colonel at the front, interrogating German prisoners to learn about their military strategies, how many soldiers they had left, and if they were retreating. I became very good at it promising them that the French soldiers would go easier on their German families if they helped the French army. This seemed to work well. Also, 
I listened to the German radio reports of military movements. I saw a lot of carnage on the front lines. My missions were to cross a mountainous area into a heavily entrenched German army zone. My escort, 20 Moroccan commandos, took me across about four miles of fields. This was always done at night and in absolute silence. The snow was very deep in places and it was difficult to see. They would leave me at a mountain path and I would continue on alone into the German area. But it took a few tries to be successful once they steered me toward the wrong mountain path and I had to turn back. In Germany, I had no map, no compass, only my memory and my wits. I am very observant and I notice things that most people do not. You know, making decisions quickly was in my nature. My intelligence training was very intense, but you cannot develop quick decision-making overnight. I was chosen because I could speak German and French fluently without a trace of accent. In the army, things happen much faster. People don't go very deep. They say, you speak German, you want to do it, go ahead. (laughs) I thought, okay, I can do this. But they were amazed when I did do it. When I did it, I enjoyed it. It was extremely stimulating. I was watching from outside. Above my head, I was my own witness. I did not know I was capable of that. Also, I was extremely lucky. I have been very lucky in my life and still am. I got out of trouble several times, but I was never arrested. I had a sixth sense of danger. I remember one time in Paris, I stopped before going down into the subway where the Nazis were indiscriminately searching people. At the last minute, I felt I shouldn't go and turned around. Another time I stopped in a town square because I felt I shouldn't go. I cannot explain it. And every time it saved my life. When it is very dangerous, you go back to your primitive reflexes. In espionage work, no one is watching. No one around, no one would know what I did. And this causes you to take more risks and make decisions very fast. There were not always good decisions. They were not always right, but I was never paralyzed. I always acted. When bad things occur, you have to be able to overcome the bad times. I learned never to judge anybody else. You don't know what frame of mind others are in. Everyone is different and can be very afraid when minor things occur. I cannot judge anybody else. I thought I was incapable of doing things, and I did them anyway. Everybody has to live their own lives, and it is difficult to give suggestions. I do not like to influence. I am not the type who likes to be influenced. But I have gotten more out of life by being adventurous. At age 84, I swam with the dolphins in Mexico. It's important to do new things. I am enthusiastic and grateful for life. I never believed I was a hero, and I still don't. I only felt I was doing the right thing. That was Ayla's story. Ayla was voiced by award-winning actor Nicola Lippmann. On the next episode of Invisible Women, I'll explore archetypes. Archetypes. That's coming up on the next episode. Please visit us on the web where you can sign up for the newsletter to discover more articles about espionage, intelligence agencies, and women. You can also leave comments and questions, and you can do that on the website at www.invisiblewomen.ca. This podcast is produced by Robert Wiemet. I'm Diane Gregg. Thanks for listening. Do you know a funny thing? In France, you have to buy your own decorations. (laughs) You have to ask for them. 
but not this one. This one is the Legionnaire, very beautiful. Uh, you can turn it over and the other side is also beautiful. This one is the Medal Militaire. It is like the Congressional Medal, only given to soldiers or to non-commissioned officers. When I gave a talk in my hometown, the veterans gave it to me, it is very important.